Hey everybody, welcome to the Put Up Your Dukes podcast. I am Rob Dukes. This is episode number six. My guest today, Mr. Lars Fredrickson from Rancid and the old firm Casuals and probably 50 other fucking bands. Um, he's a fucking killer dude, killer uh, just friend and uh, we had a, a great conversation. I hope you enjoy it. Um, we talked about, uh, man, we got fucking deep. We went, we talked about fucking skinheads and, and Nazis. We got a little political. We got a little, uh, we got about, talked about music. We talked about his beginnings and, uh, and a bunch of shit, man. It was fucking great. I am, uh, <clears throat> I'm smoking the, uh, Jacob's Ladder from Southern Draw. This is a really good fucking cigar. Uh, I've been smoking it over coffee planning on how I'm going to do this podcast and how I was going to do this intro. Um, So, uh, first thing, I asked you guys to email me, rob at putupyourdukespodcast.com, and a guy sent me in a song, and I said I would play it on here, and uh, he sends me a link. Uh, The band is Homicide. The song is Scourge of God. like the title, like uh, the band name. It's pretty cool. They're from Canada. And then I said, oh, I'll play it on here. But it's it's not unsigned, man. You gotta it, you, it's licensed by a, a company, and I uh, I don't want to have my podcast pulled because I played the song. So anyway, you can go on YouTube, find it. It's a band called Homicide. The song Scourge of God, cool song. Uh, it had a, it's like a mid tempo kind of thing. It was kind of grooving along and cool. Singer sounds, uh, you know, he's got some fucking gutty, fucking cool shit. So. Uh, yeah, man, good band, and uh, I liked it. Um, Marcus Allen sent me an email, right? I'm going to take off my sunglasses so I can put on my reading glasses. I'm going to read the fucking email. Uh, he says, uh, Rob, I wanted to reach out and thank you for starting up the podcast. I first heard you on Doug Stanhope's podcast show a long time ago, and uh, that's what got me listening to Exodus and Generation Kill. Right on. I've listened to all the episodes that you have put out so far, and it has been delightful. Backdrop while I do research on an academic article I'm working on. It's a good cigar, man. I know I'm at the end, but this is like the best part. When you're smoking a cigar, the flavor all builds up until the very end. And, uh... This one's like just such a smooth... Good cigar. Anyway, okay. Moving on. If you are still taking suggestions for show content and guests, I think people will be interested if you interview DMC. Also, I think it would be great. Need to hear you talk to Elisa and Angela from uh, Arch Enemy just to see a different perspective of women in metal. Eh, maybe. That sounds like a good idea. Yeah. Singing and screaming. Yeah, I mean, some of them chicks are fucking dark, man. Holy shit. Um, Lastly, on the lead-up to the podcast with Peter Taggart, you asked which is worse, Louis C.K. getting off or Exxon pillaging the resources of a poor country. Obviously, Exxon is worse than the Louis controversy. I agree. Um, Obviously, uh, but I think the question is a no-win across the... Given the... uh, I'm such an idiot... But I think the question is a no-win across, given the problems with this extensive cultural disconnect this country is between those who who practice rational and measured thought and skepticism versus those who are easily manipulated out of ignorance and lack of desire to contribute to society. People do not want to attempt to reason through and understand the global impact of an Exxon corporation because Exxon has no face. Exxon is like McDonald's in scope, but the concept is more like God. We know God is a concept. We can't see God, feel God, or touch God, but we might serendipitously interact with him through people that claim to understand or know God in some way or fashion. Louis C.K., though he has a face and a name that we can look at and yell at, (coughs) which makes it an easy and digestible thing for people to rally around and let out frustrations toward. Again, thank you for reading through my long, wordy response, which was way too long. And I look forward to future shows. Stay badass. Best, Mark Howard. Thanks, man. I mean, yeah, dude. I mean, the the Exxon is one of the worst things ever, you know. Um, But we need it because 
I mean, I drive a Corvette, and I need all the gas I can get. I mean, I think it's like four miles at a fucking gallon. Uh, so, that being said, uh, I try to be funny about it, but it's true. I mean, if they make an electric Corvette, I would definitely, I would definitely drive that. But electric is no better. The batteries are shit. They're they're wasteful, and they and they uh, have a, a a really bad impact on the environment. But then again, I don't know shit, so maybe I don't. I wonder why they don't take all the fucking used batteries that are fucked up and just put them on a rocket and throw them into space. I mean, <clears throat> it seems that throwing shit into the ocean, which they've been doing forever. Did you know there's garbage barges just being thrown out into the ocean? They take a barge from New York City <clears throat> and they drive it about 50 miles offshore and then they just throw it, they dump it into the ocean. At least, I mean, I mean, how much garbage can New York City make in a day? I'm going to say it's probably a lot. It's probably, it's probably so much that we, we, you can't really comprehend it unless you saw it visually. But I'm sure it's fucking awful. Uh, so that's what they've been doing forever. The East River used to be so bad when I was a kid. You couldn't, you couldn't even go. It, it was so diseased and fucked up. Then they uh, regulated how much uh, people could dump into it, and it's slowly it's just gotten better with time. I think the best thing that probably happened to Earth is if, if humans went away, it would probably be a fucking wonderland of of uh, awesomeness. If uh, these opposable thumb creatures were gone, and the only thing running around were cockroaches and rats. And dogs. And maybe Persian cats. I like those. Anyway, I want to thank you guys for the emails. And um, I this week it's been a it's been a cool week. I uh I was home, I got I got COVID again, so I was home uh just trying to get over the cough and not spread it to anybody else. So I've been kinda isolating. I watched JFK Revisited by Oliver Stone. And uh um, I, I I don't mind admitting that uh, I was brought to tears by it. At the end, you see that uh, they murdered this man in front of his wife and his family. Um, they blew his head off, and um, because he was idealistic. And when you see the wealth of information that's been allowed to be read, that was hidden for so long, um, it's absolutely fucking heart wrenching and heartbreaking. And uh, I don't know, it makes me a wuss or whatever, man, but I, I, I had legit tears at watching this thing. It was, it was really tragic and sad, and it seems like to me, in my personal opinion, that um, uh, the earth changed. The people changed. The United States changed. It just seemed to, um, that it almost seemed like evil had triumphed. Maybe not all the way yet, but it definitely... It's a downward spiral. It's not like it's gotten better where race relations are better and the poor are doing better. And it just seems like it's uh, like a no-win situation. And it's, uh, it, you know, maybe, I, maybe my, I, I'm idealistic too and in thinking that um, we could as a race uh, of beings uh, expect better. Um, but... Watching this documentary was moving, and it, it, it uh, affected me. And I started thinking about, um, you know, what led me. To, so the new generation kill record is done. Uh, we sent it off to the label. Um, it is complete. And the, the thing that I uh, was thinking about after watching this documentary is I, I, I read a, a couple books um, during the process of writing the lyrics for that record. One was uh, Tom O'Neill wrote a book called Chaos, uh, the CIA, Charles Manson, and the Secret History of the 60s. And uh, he and, uh, I'd known about the program, but he enlightened me deeply about this program called MK Ultra, where uh, the, the CIA was using um, LSD to try to create a Manchurian candidate. Um, and if you read the, the book uh, by... Uh, John, John Marks, uh, The Search of the Manchurian Candidate, what they really wanted to do was create a, uh, they wanted to be able to turn someone into a robotic uh, killer 
with just saying like a phrase or whatever and then have them have no memory of it and then and then and then just not remembering it and then the task was done the murder or, or uh, you know was done or whatever they wanted to do and then they wouldn't be able to remember doing it so um this book tom o'neill talks about <clears throat> um how this all unfolded and uh the government was using uh they bought all the lsd uh at once <laughs> from a from a uh a place i think it was in uh russia where it was invented by accident and uh, can you imagine the guy that fucking accidentally invented LSD? Basically, what he did, he was working on a, on uh, with chemicals, and he got some on his hand, and all of a sudden, he was fucking tripping. Now, if you've ever tripped on LSD, which I have, uh, it is a, a, a crazy experience when you even know you're going into it. Can you imagine what it would be like if you didn't know what was happening? I mean, he thought he was going insane. He thought he, you know. So what the MK Ultra program was, they were using prisoners and uh, 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 mental patients, uh, people that uh, were locked up, couldn't really talk to anybody, didn't have a, a, a an avenue to express any kind of, uh, you know, th- shit that was going like and they were forcing these people without their knowledge to take lsd and then filming them and then uh, basically what they wanted to do was uh, create a, a super soldier and then somehow manson was part of this like manson was part of a project that mixed lsd and speed and uh in san francisco in the in the 60s and then he uh, went back to L.A. and then did all, you know, what his insane, you know, thing that he did was all created by uh, this thing that the government uh, did. And, uh, you know, if you do a, a dive on it, I did a deep dive and I wrote lyrics about it. My new album is called MK Ultra. Uh, it comes out January 28th. I hope you guys enjoy it. Not every song is about MK Ultra, but uh, there's a few. Uh, they all have like a, you know, uh, there's a, a deep-seated uh, underlying thought process through all the, the record, through all the thing. And, uh, you know, um, I'm very proud of it. Anyway, you guys, uh, I, I'm going to try not to bore you too much. I hope you enjoy my, my conversation with Lars. He's fucking awesome. And uh, I will see you next week. With another uh, podcast, I have a really good one coming up, uh, and I hope you enjoy. And uh, once again, if you want to send in uh, questions or if you want to like, send me songs that are unsigned, uh, I will listen to them. And uh, you know, and if I can, if it's not signed, I will play it on here. But I can't play uh, ones that are on YouTube or licensed by some other music company. So make sure it's just you know you and your boys doing your shit and then sending me the mp3 or mp4 or whatever um anyway enjoy my conversation with lars fredrickson have a great day well hi hello lars how are you hello. i'm i'm good i'm drinking coffee out of my motorhead glass i'm, I'm drinking it out of my uh sunday papers mug uh, that's oh. a uh greg fitzsimmons uh, has a podcast with uh, mike gibbons and i love their podcast on sundays Ooh. They do the thing like they just kind of um, go over the week's news and um, it's just, they're just very funny. And anyway, so uh, I've always, uh, well, I feel kind of bad. Should I wear my glasses? You can do it. Yeah, man. You can go ahead. Yeah. I, you know, I just want to be able to see you. I can't see shit with them. I'm going to do that. I'm going to do my first ever interview with my (laughs) specs on. Okay. I'm not. Fuck it. No. (laughs) (laughs) If my eyes get tired, I'll do it. What right. happened to us? Remember when we could see perfectly? Dude, I used to, I, I remember it was, I was about 39 and I went to, I got pulled over and I pulled out my license and uh, the guy said, do you live at this address? And he showed it to me and I go, I can't read that. <laughs> and I realized I needed glasses. I was like, I, I'll tell you my address. I don't know what it says on there, but yeah. So I was like, fuck, I need reading glasses, man. It's getting old. Yeah. Well, I've, I've been calling Matt mm-hmm. and Tim like four eyes for like, you know, 10 years. <laughs> and, and finally I had to get him there and Matt just kind of looked at me and he gave me the look, you know, it's like, you know, the look of like, I told you now, now what motherfucker, you know, mm-hmm. what I mean? he didn't have to actually say anything. I was like, I know, I know, I know. I'm not calling you that anymore. I'm sorry. 
Uh, anyway. So, my I have, so I have like a list of questions, but I'm going to take it easy because you know you know you know I've been friends for a while, so we can just normally just have a conversation. But I had a list of questions too, bro. I know I'm going to do that both. So my okay. first question was, how do you feel about a band wearing their own T-shirts on stage? Well, it depends on who you are, right? I feel I feel like you know some people get carte blanche. You know what I mean? Like if you're fucking Lemmy and you're rocking <laughs> your own shirt. Yeah, like fucking go ahead. You're goddamn. You're Joe Strummer, okay. who used to wear yeah. his own shirt. Yeah, you know, if you're in They Might Be Giants, <laughs> then you're a fucking kook wearing your own shirt. See, you I never, I never wore my own shirts. I always wore the opening band shirts or like some other band that I loved. You know, um, well, well, I, I see now. It's hard for me now because like now I'm in a lot of my favorite bands. I know. <laughs> So you're in every band. I think I think that's what I read on Bottomouth. Lars is in every band on the planet right now. <laughs> well, it's like Last Resort is like one of my favorite all time fucking bands, right? And right. I have like three last week. The, the the t-shirt of the band that I have the most is Agnostic Front. I have more Agnostic Front t-shirts than than any other t-shirt in my repertoire. Okay. But I will say that the last resort and stomper 98 i mean these bands were like my some of my favorite bands and had been going on for so long before i even you know step foot into them i can't stop i kind of feel like okay maybe i can get a pass you know but like um i won't i i you you will very rarely ever see me in a rancid t-shirt yeah um but then again like tim rocks a rancid t-shirt from time to time but it's him it's you know so i saw I feel yeah. like he's in that category of like carte blancheness. The only time I ever wore an Exodus shirt, and I didn't wear it on stage, it was because I was out of laundry in Europe and I needed a shirt that was clean. So I just said, I just went to the merch table and give me that. I'm wearing that. That's yeah. the, but that's kind of what you do. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I kind of feel like if you do have you, if you've ever caught me in my own band's t shirt, if it's not the last resort, <laughs> it was that it's reason. It's because I ran out, like you said, it's like I <laughs> couldn't do laundry. I mean, we're in fucking France somewhere, yeah. they don't have laundry, yeah, and, you know, anywhere in the country. You know, yeah. there's, there's still shit in a hole over there. Some some places, dude. But, man, do you do you remember being in, in Switzerland at L7 at that place L7, and that was the only place with a washer and dryer, and everyone would fight to wake up early to get to it. I they were they cook for you and everything. Yeah, 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 yeah man. I feel like the Europeans really know how to treat bands. I feel like Americans, we just they don't, don't give, give a fuck. They don't give a fuck, dude. No, I Play feel your... like like even in France, bro. Like France gets a bad rap, you know, with French people and stuff. America. yeah but I, I feel like we're like the french to touring bands like we don't, we don't yeah. give you shit we give you like a bag of like you know unsalted tortilla chips <laughs> and may maybe a fucking carrot and some shitty ass hummus yeah like a, a the vegetable plate with the ranch in the middle that's just like fuck i like it never gets eaten it you know what i mean it's eaten and you're no. paying for that shit yeah you know what i mean so i threw that into uh we were at a festival and there was a big, it was all veggie layout at this festival. And uh, in the room next to us was, um, was, was Queensryche. And for, this is when Jeff Tate was still in the band. And for some reason, he was a dick. They were kind of dicks to us. So while they were on stage, we took our entire veggie plate tray thing, the table, and threw it into their, into their room. And, and then we, so. they, yeah, and they had that coming, yeah. Well, so. you know what? Those guys didn't really look like metalheads. They looked like mathematicians with long hair. You know what I mean? <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm not going to give no love to Bill Kreens right. Like, you know, don't fucking yeah. Exodus, bro. Right. Do not well, you know what it is, too? If I met them, they're probably really nice guys. I've just never met them. You know what I mean? You know so. What? Fuck them. If they, you know, if they deserve a veggie fucking tray and they're fucking you get tossed at them, then there's, there's got to be a reason. There's gotta he be a did that day. So, how do you feel about all these fucking rappers? cop in your style because you were the first guy that had a face tattoo and now they're all trying to look like Lars fucking Fredrickson from well, you know, fucking Rancid. Like, look at look at what I'm wearing. <laughs> oh dude my boy Daryl. Fuck yeah. I, I love Run DMC. That's the thing to me like my kid, my oldest Wolfgang, he's all into like Playboy Cardi and Cardi B and all these like hip hop kids, you know. Yeah. And he went with his buddy uh, it was before Christmas to go see Playboy Playboy Cardi, yeah. and 
he got into the pit and it was just him and his homie. And it was like at the San Francisco, it was like the Bill Graham. Okay. And, and he got into the pit and when he came out and I picked him up, him and his homie up, they were sweating head to toe and they had just, they were pumped. Right. You know what I mean, and they were so stoked. And, and I, and I was like, Whoa, tell me about your experience. Cause he got in the pit. Like right. he was in the pit. And I, I saw some, and then the manager for Rance and Kevin Wolf, uh, cause I was asking him like, what, who are the, cause I knew like guys like, uh, what was his name? Um, oh shit! Uh, fuck! I forget his name. Is it one of the newer kind of rapper kids? He he was the kid that that ate all the drugs on the plane and died. He was twenty one, very young. Uh, I don't I don't know. Well, anyways, uh, it's it's kind of a sad story, but um, you know, I get exposed to to that that some of that the new right. hip hop from my from my kids, you know, because that's kind of what their flavor is. Yeah. Even though Wolfgang loves metal and loves punk, he also yeah. likes this shit. But it's it, when I st- kind of sat down and listened to it, it kind of felt like the same energy, huh. you know, this same energy that we were kind of doing, you know, with Did, Thrash or the punk. These guys. Does he know all the like, words? Does he know the words of every song? And like, oh, see, that's crazy. Like, yeah, so I get my kids every other week, right? And yeah. and it's funny because me and my partner Joanna, like, when Wolfgang, he's got the upstairs, right? And you can, and I, he's at that point where you don't have to tell him to take a shower anymore. He just kind of does it. Yeah, and and it's about eleven thirty, eleven forty five every night. We call it Club Wolfgang. It's like having the loud upstairs neighbor. He he's got the fucking boombox up there, and he's playing the fucking you know whatever it is <laughs> that he's down for. And it sounds like a, you know boom boom you know and shit like that. It's right. like rape music, but it's like some some ga- some gangster rap or whatever it is, whatever these. And it feels like punk rock to me. It feels like that same kind of energy that we had. But it's just it's just now a different form. You know, it's kind of like these kids are all about the energy. And, I, and that's what I was trying to when I was interviewing my son about the show. I was like, well, what is it about? What is it about this music that you like? And he's like, it's it just makes me feel alive, which was right. what, basically what it boils down to. And it's like I, I was like, OK, I understand that because when I heard punk or some, a lot of the thrash stuff, that's the feeling I got it like it was like fuck i'm alive you know yeah and he wants to go get in the shit with that that's fucking totally cool i mean now he's like you know he's like he's into skateboarding and hip-hop and punk rock and he's got baggy pants on and you know trying to find nikes and Air right. jordans and shit and it's like it's an amal- amalgamation of a lot of different things you know and I, and I feel like there's a lot more freedom today it's like back when we were kind of discovering this kind of hard music you really had to choose a side and when you chose your side yeah, you had to really be fucking committed. It was like a commitment. You know what I mean? It's like, you know, you were going to live, breathe and breathe and die for that shit. Now, with the invention, I think of Spotify's and all this stuff. It's like you can go and listen to Cardi B or whatever, then go listen to Exodus and then go listen to Rancid or whoever it is. And you can do it and you can make a playlist with all those bands, you know, and go into the shower like my 14 year old and and jam out. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, I think it's what are they singing about? about? A lot of the times I feel like it's about girls or money or, you know, or whatever it may be, or maybe depression or, or whatever. I, I catch little things here and there. Huh. Sometimes it's about love. Yeah. So I kind of, I kind of feel like it, it's kind of like the rock and roll, you know, <clears throat> what does rock and roll sing about? Well, it can sing about everything under the sun. I feel like rap music, the stuff that I've been exposed to through my kids does a lot of the same stuff right it talks about you know kind of coming up you know or get you know you know achieving a goal or you know fucking a chick i don't yeah. know I mean, it doesn't it, you know i feel like it, it all sort of you know uh is all relevant to them at i mean what was relevant to us when we were 14 like for me it was just like punk shows getting drunk Maybe I, you know, maybe I would hook up with a chick. I don't know. I mean, it's, they're doing the same shit. It's just a different soundtrack. What kind of kid were you? What kind of, like when you, before, how old when you picked up your first guitar? I was probably about 14 or 15. Okay. Before you found punk rock, what kind of kid were you? Were you, were you a happy kid? Were you like BMX and skateboarding? Were you, um, were well, you? We didn't, we didn't have any money. So I didn't, right. have any, I didn't have a bike. I didn't have a skateboard. So, uh, but the first band I loved was Kiss. I mean, that okay. was that that was like the lightning bolt. And I remember when, when about was it seventy four? 
Wait, so 71, 72, 73, 74. So 74, 75, my mom and dad were splitting up and my mom took me and my brother to Denmark. And we stayed there. And my cousin, our older cousin, Karen, she had, she was into like chicory tip and slade and sweet and, and T-Rex and like kind of the glammy kind of stuff. Yeah, like glam metal. Yeah, yeah. And that's the kind of shit that she was, David Bowie, that kind of stuff. Yeah. And so I think that's probably why I immediately went to Kiss when, when I first got exposed to them. Because that I feel like Kiss, in retrospect, you can kind of look back, they were trying to be Slade and T-Rex and these type, types of bands, Mop the Hoople and whatever right. it was. And so I feel like I gravitated towards Kiss and, and then, of course, graduated into ACDC. And then after that, that's when I discovered the Ramones and punk rock. So that was about yeah. 1979, 1980. So I was like nine and 10 years old. So when I, when I got into that music, I, I, it almost, it, it felt like I had arrived. I yeah. finally found something. It was like a lightning bolt hit me. And I was like, oh, this is where I belong. You know? Were, were you, uh, before you picked up a guitar, were you like uh, in school? Did you play like, were you in the band? You play like a trombone or a bear or any of that? You didn't do any no. musical thing before you got the guitar? No. I, I knew that I wanted to play guitar. I, you know, we, we, we used to take, we used to have baseball bat kiss concerts in my bedroom. You know, all the yeah. kids in the neighborhood. I did I tennis did. rackets. Yeah, I did a tennis yeah, racket. Yeah, anything you could get. Your, I mean, we used to like take like push pins and on the baseball bats and put push pins and make uh, rubber bands, the strings. No shit. And we no. would try and like, I'm such a Virgo. I'd have to have all red rubber bands or all gray. <laughs> you know, I just took so, a shoelace so I could hang it there oh, and do nice. this. <laughs> you know what I mean? That's took nice. two shoelaces and made them go. That's what I remember doing. Yeah. So, but and, I, yeah. And, did you have brothers and sisters? I had an older brother who was, okay. he was four years older than me, but the neighborhood, it was different. You know, we had those neighborhood kids where it was all project housing. Right. So, you know, you would have, you had also, also different kinds of cultures there too. So I got exposed to like run DMC and, okay. you know, Africa, Bobata and the soul song. I mean, I went and saw my friend, Wade Mendoza took me to see Houdini, the Egyptian lover, ice tea and Africa, Bombata. No I shit. was the headliner. <clears throat> I was the only white kid. And I was about 11 years old. I had a mohawk at the time. It was a little, little mohawk. And my buddy Wade, no one really liked him. And no one really liked me because I was punk. And he was dressed like Prince and shit. So um, we, we, we clicked. And his dad was like this crazy Vietnam vet. Had like Uzis all over the house. And he, he had like, you know, there was like, there was like 12 kids. You know what I mean? They lived in this house whatever. And they adopted me, like, it, you know, brought me in. And so I got exposed to hip hop like that and, or what we called rap music or whatever. And then, uh, I in turn, you know, played GBH for him and discharge and shit that I was into. Right. I don't think he was feeling it as much as I liked, you know, this other stuff, but he, he would sit and listen with me and like make comments about it. And like, we kind of understood each other. Yeah. And, um, <clears throat> so I got exposed to a wide, a wide variety of music. I mean, most of the stuff that was going off in my neighborhood was like Van Halen, you know, Skinner, you know, and shit like that. So um, for me, I, I, that wasn't really, that didn't like, it didn't really like red, like it didn't really hit me, you know, like, huh. like, like the Ramones or ACDC or kiss or, you know, later on GBHs and the business and shit like that. Right. I don't know what it was about those those bands. I, I I I just I don't feel like I could relate because I don't think I felt like I maybe I couldn't do what they did. That was one of the things. Yeah. I, so you and I were on a, on a very similar trajectory, except uh, I had more of the I I in along with the Clash and the Ramones. I, I was in New York, so I but I also had like like. I was listening to like the who and uh, Led Zeppelin because that was what they, records that were handed down to me. And when I first found my own first music, it was uh, queen and that album news of the world. And then I remember that song, sheer heart attack. And I remember that song being like the catalyst for me finding music that sounded like that song. And that right. led into uh, the Ramones and the clash and, and then, you know, and then, but I wasn't, uh, I wasn't like you. I didn't have, I didn't pick a side. I had long hair. But I and I liked metal, but I liked punk rock, but I also still liked Queen and Rush and Van Halen and ACDC. And I, I just I didn't really uh I didn't conform to all that those those things. Even though I I, I wanted to, uh, I just don't think I at the time I was able to even uh find people that would have uh 
Yeah, I was a little introverted, but I also had, you know, I had an emerging drug problem coming on. So that isolated me in my own deal. So, and I'm going to, we're going to talk about that too, but. um, Well, it's not, you're a lot like my brother in that sense. Like, even though my brother was a skinhead and into that shit, he loved Iron Maiden and Metallica. I mean, he saw Metallica and all these bands. I mean, a lot of the times we would find out about Metallica and the Slayers and all these Exodus my brother took me to see Exodus for the first time. And I mean, I remember seeing uh, what turns out to be Zetro's very first show with the band. Oh, when they, yeah. Way back. <laughs> it, it's like, so I was at that show or whatever. <clears throat> but my point is, it's that like, my brother was always the gateway. For me, I was a little bit more hardlined. I've always been a little bit more hardlined. I've, I've, I've softened over age, but like, it was probably because I could never like you do something half-assed. Right. And and it's like, if I'm going to commit to doing drugs, I'm going to do that. If I'm going to yeah. commit to drinking, I'm going to do that. If I'm going to commit to punk rock or tattooing my face, I'm going to do that. So right. I can't just do one of something. I have to do it all. Were you, go- were you like a hooligan? Were you part of the whole hooligan scene? Just going to shows and fighting and drinking and fucking and doing, Well, you know? I, guess, I guess for me, like <clears> my, first, <throat> my first sort of, uh, I guess, consequence when I was about 11, when I first went to juvenile hall and um, I was doing things that probably no 11 year old should have been doing, but it was, you know, it's, it's kind of extraordinary circumstances. My, my dad was out of the picture, but very young age. My mom's a, a world war II survivor. You know, she grew up in Nazi occupied Denmark. Right. And then sees her family get killed in front of her when she's four and five years old. Right. So there's this element of like fear you know, in my household that we're going to not going to have enough or we, and and to be honest, we didn't have, I mean, we were working poor before it was a fucking term. I'm at a 10th grade education. When my dad left, she now has to raise two boys by herself. She put herself through key punch school, which ended up being like computer stuff. And and she ended up working for Hewlett Packard making, you know, $21,000 a year, you know, and supporting two boys. I mean, it, it was tough time. And this is through the Reagan era as well, where, you know, people were, you know, couldn't go to work anymore because he was fucking up the economy so bad with his trickle down economics and yeah. shit like that. So, you know, regardless of what you say that, but the Bay Area at that time was very blue collar, very working class. And in, in the in the 80s there, like, you know, it was it was tough, you know, and I know New York had its moments, too, you know. Obviously. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> but I think, you know, the Bay Area in general you know, a lot of this hard, where this, a lot of this hard music was coming out of, it, it made perfect sense, you know? So, um, but, you know, I, I, I can't say I was a bad kid. Cause I think I've always had a pretty good heart. I just think that like, I just did shit because maybe I wasn't getting nurtured in a way that maybe was right. maybe that a, an 11 year old needed. So I, I went out on the street to find that and I found music and I found a family and I found a culture to identify with and that you know obviously perpetuated that uncomfortable part of myself and i therefore i would do things like break into people's houses and smoke angel dust and you know yeah. just do shit like that and you know become violent and have violence perpetrated upon me you know so it's yep. like, <coughs> you know did you have um did you ever have run-ins because of your mom's um upbringing did you did you ever come into conflict with the neo-nazi skinheads that were in the yeah. scene um I got stabbed I got sta- I mean I had a I had a black girlfriend at the time you know and I, I was at a party and some of the we called them boneheads you know they, yeah. they were never skinheads you can't yeah. call a nazi a skinhead because that's pride for them well, well, skinhead is is starts with Jamaican reggae and Jamaican culture, hence the term skinhead reggae. You know, so mm. it's like you can't even really, you know, bring right wing politics into the skinhead or any kind of politics into the skinhead thing because skinheads were apolitical. It was all about being working class. You know, right. so to bring politics in, into it is kind of a. Huh. Anyways, but that's just my opinion. I'm just other people, but so the right wing thing like that. You know, I was in a fight. You know, in in a party, and I got stabbed by one of them dudes we got the best of them but i didn't even know i was stabbed and i ended up <clears throat> here's a funny story i'll just get into it so it's about three in the morning the girl the guy called my girlfriend the n-word you know i was with my friend my friend chucks a beer bottle and it rings right past my face smashes this kid right 
the bottle falls, the kid picked it up and I thought somebody had kicked me because a melee, we were in a, like a, a house and there was like a, like a table in the middle of the kitchen. And, and I, I distinctly remember, it was like an island, you know, in the middle of a kitchen and they're very common now, but at the time, you know, you didn't see, this was, it was a rich chick's house, right? So anyways, I thought I got kicked. <clears throat> anyways, the fucking place goes off, the party's over. My buddy has a small Toyota Tercel and there's like six of us. And I'm like this, I'm wearing bleach jeans in my DMs. And, I, and I'm, I'm go, walking up the stairs and I feel something squishing in my boots. And I'm like, what the fuck, right? So I get upstairs because it was dark and I'm, I'm a little inebriated, but I'm sort of coming out of it because of the adrenaline or whatever. And I get to my bedroom and I look down and I pulled up my pants because they were kind of rolled up. And I noticed that everything's red. It's, and, but nothing's touching my pants, right? Yeah. But there's a, there's a hole in my pants. And then I kind of inspected that. And I see I got a big gash. It just looks like hamburger, right? right. So I take off Fuck. my shoe and, I, and there's blood just in the shoe, right? I can kind of pour it out. And I'm like, well, and now my biggest fear is my mom's going to wake up and see this and kick my ass, right? My, <laughs> we called her Danish Napoleon because she was like five foot nothing, but she was a fucking tyrant. But anyway, uh, so I, my bright idea is like, well, I got to fucking sew this up. And so about a couple of weeks prior, me and my brother were watching this thing on PBS about the Vietnam War and about super glue and how super glue was invented in the Vietnam oh, War to, to do to, wounds. Yeah. Yes. I do it at work. I'm like, like bing, the light bulb, right? So I got, I'm like, well, what I'll do is I'll sew it up and I'll, but I'll put some super glue on it first. So I stripped down to my underwear and I have to go outside now because I realize I'm going to be making some noise and I'm sitting under a street light. And I got uh, right on the street light. There's all these bugs and shit because it's kind of summertime. So I do the super glue. I pinch it up. I put the super glue. And then I'm like, well, I got to sew it up. And the only thing I had was fishing wire line. Okay. So I think it was like 10 pound test, right? So I sew it up with that. Just thinking it's done. About two weeks later, I'm getting out of the shower and my leg is now turning all different kinds of shades of greens and stuff. And I'm, I was kind of, the door was open. I had a towel around my waist and my brother goes, what the fuck is that? And I go, oh, I got stabbed and I sewed it up. And he's like, dude, that thing's fucking infected. He's like, what did you sew it up with? And I go, um, the fishing line that was in, before I could even get in my mouth, my brother just clocks me right in the fucking face, right? And I drop. He goes, what are you fucking doing? That shit doesn't dissolve. He goes, it's going to be in you for life. It's plastic, you fucking idiot, right? <laughs> So I'm like, and he goes, we got to take that out. And I'm like, oh, really? So I'm sitting there buck ass naked on the toilet. And my brother's got a bottle of hydrogen peroxide and a toothbrush. And we got to scrape because it's scabbed over. He's literally like digging at it, bro. It was oh. the holiest shit. My brother also built models. So he had this little exacto blade. And so we had to cut out the, the, the fishing line. And so I cut it all out, got it kind of redone, whatever. It was still so, somewhat healed a little bit. We just, I just put Neosporin all over it for, for a couple of days. That was it. I, I got the scar here. I'll show it to you next time in person. Do you got it? Did you tattoo it up or did you leave it? I left it. It's right by my cock spar tattoo. Oh, all right. Company. But huh. yeah, so that, that, that's kind of, that was my childhood in a nutshell in a way. Okay. Yeah. And you, so you started drinking it. 10 11 yeah if not earlier i mean yeah. my first my first time i ever drank was at my dad's company picnic i was seven and there was a guy in the middle of this because it was at the big basin park it a, it's like a national park national forest here yeah and there was a guy who looked like david lee roth and he was wearing a pair of daisy dukes and he's in the middle of the stream stream drinking a bottle of gallo telling everybody the cannonball and of course i went up to it and just chugged it and that was the first time i ever got drunk Huh. Mine was Jack Daniels. I was uh, 15. Yikes. Yeah. I uh, drank, uh, th me, and me, th me and two friends drank the whole bottle. I, we used to drink a third. And then uh, we were sitting there, and then uh, he punched me in the face, and I just started laughing. <laughs> and then that was it. And, and then that, that's, you know. Um, so, you so uh, I want to get into the sobriety and stuff too. As long as we can stay anonymous, because I, I believe absolutely, in the traditions, I believe in the absolutely, traditions. yeah. Um, so uh, I was going to ask you, what was the what was the turning point? What was the worst? Uh, 
Do you have like a worst memory? Because I, 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 I know you know I've talked before and I've heard your story. Uh, and I've been I want to talk about the, like the worst moment that you had that that led you to uh, the path that you're now on. Well, I, I I feel like it was a culmination of a few things. I mean, you know, because as I sort of you know got more and more into uh, you know that aspect of my life, I feel like that became everything else became secondary. So whether it was the band I was in, the girl I was dating or whatever, that was always secondary, you know, and my primary purpose every day was to, to get inebriated. And I would always find myself being surrounded by people who were either with the same mindset who had the means or uh, had the same mindset, didn't have the means, but would do exactly what I would do to get what I needed. Right. So, you know, I black, the, the first time I ever blacked out, I ended up in, in, I, I started up in the Bay Area in San Jose, and I woke up a couple of days later in La Jolla, California, which is by San Diego. Right. And I'd never blacked out before. And I remember it started with like, you know, drinking at first, and then drugs became a thing. And um, so that was one of the first kind of things that kind of happened to me where I was like, whoa, you know, it was the first eye opener. And luckily, you know, somebody else was there at this house. Um, And it's funny because he was, he used to drive around seven seconds and um, he gave me a ride back to the Bay area. Uh, So that was the first thing. And then when I was in the UK subs, that's when it really kind of like got super duper bad. Like that's when I would be, you know, sort of waking up with people I didn't want to wake up with or creating chaos that shouldn't have been created or, you know, breaking guitar strings on. There was one time we played the Nottingham Rock City with Discharge and I was so shit hammered. I had 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 um, I used to use a chorus pedal to thicken up the sound because we were, you know, basically a three piece is bass, drums, guitar, yeah. vocals. Um, so, you, you know, I had a lot of space I needed to fill up. Although the songs were very, were written for sort of more riff driven, riff driven, like black Sabbath or something, you know? Yeah. So uh, I went down to turn up because I, I had done something where I'd put the effect on it. So it was a whoa, 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 whatever. And I went down to turn it down to, turn it off and i fell off the stage <laughs> into the barrier during we're, we're, while we were playing and consequently broke two strings on my guitar well as and i remember charlie was kind of looking at me just going man you fucking idiot right so i get back up onto the stage and i'm like kind of trying to figure out where i'm at because i'm sort of knocked a little loopy and the guy from the opening band says you broke two strings here's a guitar so he gives me his guitar which is like this you know fender strat copy or whatever what i didn't know is that they were tuned a whole step down so i go into the next song Uh, and of course we're a whole fucking step down uh, and it was it was just embarrassing bro it was you know that that's kind of what it like you know what it what it ended up being you know it was like one after another. Yeah, it was just, and there was, it just, it just culminated and culminated and culminated into like, you know, I, I, I always say I'm allergic, you know, to alcohol. I break out in handcuffs. Yeah, I, I mean, say that too. You know, so yeah. it's like one of those things where, you know, I feel like for me, the path was always going to be spiritual. Like it, it was, I didn't know it at the time. I feel like I was always, I'm, and, and I don't want to confuse it for religion because that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about spirituality, I get it. which is yeah. two totally different things. And the way I was brought up with my mom, you know, who was very more pagan than any kind of religious thing. And, you know, the whole idea that you could kind of co-create with this universe, right? And I'm 50 years old and I don't really care anymore. So I'm happy to talk about it, but um, to a certain extent, but. So I think that was always kind of with me, you know, and she would tell us stories about the Norse gods and, you know, there's always a, 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 you know, 
they're like it's like fairy tales about you know about moral compasses is really what religion is you know in in, in spirituality but spirituality is actually living that you know yeah yeah so, yeah so when i when i sort of replace that with that spiritual thing you know and i and that's always been a very personal thing to me because you know it's not necessarily i was fear of being judged it's more or less like you know it's it's always just been a personal thing for me so you know like with the way that i live my life it's it today um and how i kind of ab abstain from going back to that lifestyle is i i replaced it with spirituality and it's my version of spirituality and it's not about god and jesus and Bo Bo buddha and muhammad that's not what i'm talking about i'm talking about for me it's like the fucking the trees and the ocean and the world you know and the energy there there there's living proof as we walk down these streets or wherever we are that there's much more power greater powers than me at work and i feel like that's just that idea you know for me helps me stay kind of like grounded you know i, I don't you know, it's easy. I've seen it a million times. I'm sure you have. It's like when success goes to somebody's, you know, head, band, first band disease and shit like that, or just yeah. people think that their shit don't stink anymore or whatever, or they're out to get, I got to get mine. It's like, right. Get out of here. Yeah, the, the agenda, the agenda becomes personal rather than yeah. collective. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, and it's like, here's the fucking thing. We're all human beings having a human experience on planet earth. We all got to fucking figure it out and get along. Right. But yeah. everybody's so, you know, it's, they, I was I'm kind of, you know, over the last kind of couple of years and it, and it sort of culminated in a, in my second divorce and then my mom passing, like, I, I kind of just don't want to fight anything anymore like i don't really care what people do like it doesn't matter to me i don't i'm not really i don't i don't have opinions anymore like everybody's so up i feel like the world is so filled with fear and such misinformation and bullshit that yeah. like you know it, and everybody's so uh, so afraid of something that they can't see here or touch and, then, and they're they're picking sides and there there are no sides you know that's like, that's one of those things I've noticed. I'm, I'm, I call myself politically homeless. I have no agenda. I, I give a fuck. You know what I mean? Everything's yeah. so polarized that, you know, it's like, it's <laughs> like, you know, if you, it's like, I just remember with the whole mask debate, like, well, if you don't wear a mask and you obviously voted for Trump and you're a racist, yeah. or if you do wear a mask, well, you obviously are fucking communist want us to be fucking Russia. No. And it's like, never did I ever think that the middle finger to the establishment would ever come from anywhere on the right side. Mm. And it's like, I never thought like, you know, I, here's the thing, bro. Like for 40 fucking years, I have been listening to music that has been predicting, the, the, predicting the dystopian society that we now live in. <laughs> it totally. And you're telling me that I should trust the government now. Right. Uh, yeah. Are you fucking crazy? Yeah. Like, whatever you want to do with your body, you know, and this comes to like, I, I'm sorry, it's just a hot topic, but if you yeah. want to vaccinate yourself, go ahead. If you yeah. don't want to go ahead, if you yeah. want to wear a mask, go ahead. If you don't want to wear a mask, go ahead. I don't give a fuck what you're going to do, what you do. Yeah. What I do for me is what I do for me. And I'm not going to force my agenda on somebody else. That's yeah. called fascism. Yes. Okay. When you start telling people how to act, think, look, or be, you are being a fucking fascist. Now, I have firsthand experience of that because, like I said, forementioned that my mother grew up in a fascist dictatorship that was occupying her country of origin. Yeah. That took it so far as to kill her family members for not thinking, acting, doing as that fascist dictatorship wanted them to do. Yeah. Okay. So now if you can't draw parallels to what we are living in right now, then you're a fucking moron. Moron. So my thought is this. You live your life the way you want to fucking live your life. I don't give a shit. If yeah. you want to fucking, you know, who I don't care who you sleep with. I don't care if you want to change, you know, your mind, your gender, your ideas. I don't give a fuck. <laughs> right. I don't care. Wear right. a dress. Don't wear a dress. Fucking listen to rap. Don't listen to rap. Like punk, hate punk. I don't care. Like live your life. Freedom. It's America. 
live it, right? You know, right. these ideals are are very sound. It's everybody else that fucks them up. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, it, so, so I'm just in this place now where I'm just kind of like, I don't care what anybody does. I'm just going to kind of do what I'm doing and just try to do good. To me, that's the spiritual lifestyle that I'm trying to live is not because me caring about what it's anybody else is doing is not a spiritual way to live. The spiritual way to live is to let everybody, you know, experience what they're supposed to experience. So right. if you're, if you're talking a bunch of hate, you get to do that. You want to know why I allow you to do that now is because hopefully you'll learn from that. And who the fuck am I to get in the way of you and your karma? Yeah. Right? Yeah. Cause you were, we were all, we were punk rocks. We were getting in fights. We were fucking doing drugs. We, 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 we did our shit. And then, you know, you come to a point where it's just, you, you, I remember somebody asked me, how the fuck do you stay sober on fucking tour with a bunch of maniacs in Exodus? How the fuck do you, you know, cause they're maniacs dude. Right. So, and I was like, you know what, man, I don't, I don't care what anybody does until it, until it encroaches on my right. life. I don't give a fuck. They could right. drink till fucking, I don't care what they fucking do. I don't, I could care less. And that's how I've lived my life. That's how I've been sober for, you know, going on 29 years now. It is because, I had friends like you in my life who we could sit down and have a cup of coffee and we could talk and we could try to understand um, how it is, how to get through this, this thing called life without killing ourselves well, I, or somebody else. Well, I think it's as simple as having, you know, what your moral compass is, you know, and for me, yeah. it's like racism, sexism, homophobia, they're not political issues. They're the difference between right and wrong. Yeah, they're, it's like a squirrel. Like, it's the squirrel complex, I call it. Like, it's, you know, when they talk about abortion, it's like, oh, it's squirrel. Squirrel. Like, they're just yeah. taking your focus off what they're really 100%. talking about. Because you know? to me, it's like, I know racism, sexism, homophobia, you know, whatever it is, that's wrong. It's not in my, that, that's not me. Yeah. You know? I'm, I'm none of those things. Doesn't matter. And if you come in my face and try to spit some of that shit, I'll punch you. Right? <laughs> I'm not saying it's carte blanche to come up to me and talk some shit. Yeah. yeah. I'm, not, I'm not saying I'm not going to do anything. Yeah. I'm just saying it's like, I don't even participate in that. Yeah. You no. Know? What I was your worst gig? What was the worst gig you ever played? Fuck. Besides the UK sub show when you did a header off the stage trying to <laughs> change your chorus pedal. You know, see, sometimes the worst gigs you've ever played turn out to be the best gigs you've ever played. <laughs> I, 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 don't have, I don't have that experience. Okay, so. fair enough. <laughs> Uh, worst gig we've ever played any band fuck uh there's not really that hmm. i'm gonna have to think about this i just i see the thing about it is is i guess maybe it's my attitude but i remember we showed up in cork one time with the old from casuals it was on the first tour we did over there and it was a small little pub and it sold out like you know 150 people right and we get there and we don't have a place to play there's no, there's nothing. <clears throat> we basically, they had a stage which was built of these like tables and chairs, like plastic <laughs> chairs, right? And, and, and they're like, well, what do we do? And I was like, we just got to make it happen. And I remember <laughs> like the barrier was uh, like these old like seats that you'd find in like uh, Mel's diner, you know, like those, you know, those diners. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, <laughs> Dude, I play the same place. I know exactly what you're talking about. <laughs> So, and and then and I remember the microphone stand. Like I had to literally get it as high as you possibly could because there was there was no room actually where you were standing to have the microphone stand, your amp, and yourself and your guitar. So I had yeah. to put it on the floor and adjust it to the highest it went, and I was still going like this to sing. Yeah. And uh, and and Paul <clears throat> was like behind us, but lower. And then Casey, it was like it was like a Kiss concert, you know, the things right you know. But it's, and it was so it, uh, people were stressing out, and I was grabbing rope and twine and whatever I could do, yeah, to fucking to build this fucking thing. And Casey and everyone were just scrambling, put that to that to that thing. And, yeah. But and we were, it was like, oh man, this is going to be a shitter, right? Yeah. But we, but we turned that something in, into or that nothing into something, and we had an incredible show. Yeah. Uh, those are the things that I kind of remember. I mean, there, there is a bunch of shitty places that I hope I never go back to. Yeah. And there's a bunch, but and I, I don't really want to, you know, 
I don't, you know. I hear you. I hear you because you might have to go back. You might have to. Don't want to, but I have to. I get it. <laughs> there's some places in Florida that I hope I never see again. Oh, yeah. There's some, there's some places like, I, you know, I don't, there's certain towns I just hope I never see again. And and honestly, like, sometimes they come, they say, well, do you want to play? I go, no, I do <laughs> not. I do not want to go there. And I don't want to go to New Orleans again. I've I've been there. I don't care about it. I don't want to go. Uh, I just I, I didn't mind like, that one so much. I don't like we it. played we played with Goat Horse so, and they're from there so they knew the place to play so we had a pretty good show but well see yeah. this is what I'm talking about like I, I'm not saying that the city sucks or the people uh, suck or the show was, suck I'm just saying I don't want to go there yeah <laughs> I don't I, I've been to Mobile Alabama I you know there I don't want to go there to play a show I would rather uh, like I'd rather go to these like how about that that should be the better way to say. I don't want okay, to go there yeah. to play a show I don't want to go to Turkey ever again I'm good fair fair I don't right. want to go to um where was that place oh shit what was it like I, I see the place I thought I didn't want to go I want to go back Poland I want to go back oh I love Poland did you play to uh, Charlie's in uh, Anchorage do you guys ever play up in uh, Alaska Never played in Alaska, but it's mm. on my bucket list. It's yeah, my bucket list. but um, I've been, I've played every state in the union except for Alaska. I play I played I played both Dakotas. I played Montana. I played yeah, we, everything, but I, like, I played everything but Hawaii. I've, I've we've done Hawaii. We've done yeah. Hawaii. So yeah. um, we've done Hawaii a few times. That's fun though. That's yeah, fun. man. But hey, have you fun. ever have you ever been on stage and then like the song you look down at the list? And then the, you so okay, um, okay, that song's next. Uh, Adina's next. And then you forgot how to play it. Like, you're like, what the fuck? Like, what? I have been there a few times, yes. Really? Uh, yes. Um, okay, so there, there's, there's the, the funny, okay, so there's like, the un, there's like a joke in our band um, that when I fuck up, which I rarely do, and I'm proud to say that I, I barely, very rarely fuck up, but when I do, it's huge. It's like, it's the most noticeable thing you will ever see. It's, I might as well just take a shit on myself. You know what I mean? Cause that's how bad I'll fuck up. Right. I have literally called out songs that we're not supposed to be playing. I've done a monologue about it. And next thing you know, I look down and it's on the list. And goes, hey dude, we're supposed to be playing Olympia right now. And then I got to go, but first, play. <laughs> You know, I've done that. I um, what song did I forget to play just recently? It was just recently. I was like, I drew a blank. I was like, what the fuck? What the fuck? How do I play this song? So how, when you guys rehearse, do you do you go through a, a set list? Like, this is the set list we're playing, and that's it. We're that's that's what we're doing, and that's it. And we're not gonna. We're, no, you don't. No. So what what I normally do is I take the set that we've done from our very last show. Like, so the, yeah. the, the most recent show that we've had, I take that and then I go through and cause I'm a set list guy. And then I, and I come up with like 20 or 30 other songs that I think that we know, or we should learn. And then I mass text it out. What do you guys think? And sometimes they go, don't want to do that one, but rather do this one. And you're like, fuck, I didn't even think about that one. Okay. Like, sidekick just recently on this last one, sidekick and, um, there was one other one that made it into the set that we hadn't played since like 2004 or whatever. Wow. But you just forget, you know, cause you put out, you know, 10 records with 50 fucking million songs on it. Like you're going to skip one of them. Like, you know, yeah. it's a blessing and a curse. It's a blessing for the person who buys the record, but it's a curse for you. Cause I see. And that's the thing. I have a pretty photographic memory. So like I, I remember every single one of our songs. So if we had to go to play a show tomorrow, and you said you're gonna play these 25 songs. I'd say I wouldn't even have to pick it up. Like no shit, and just I could just go. Dude, that's fucking genius. That, that's yeah. not the way it is for me. That's that. Uh, that's the farthest thing for me. I need I mean, che cheat sheets and like like yeah. Well, I mean, some people are like that. For me, it's just I like I have to go do some stuff with the last resort. I don't have to. I want to, but I'm gonna go do some stuff with the last resort in February, and most of the songs on the set list, like I know that I could go there tomorrow without a rehearsal and just go do it. Wow. I don't, but I don't necessarily know if it would be the best. And so I do, before I, we go out on tour, I just get the set list and I just program it in my phone or, or whatever, how I want to do it. 
And um, sometimes I go, I'm only going to learn these songs off a cassette. And I, get a, and I get a boom box. And that means I got to fast forward and rewind, <clears throat> find the song. <laughs> Huh. I, I try to challenge myself. No you know? shit. Hatebreed, I was talking with Jamie uh, or Wayne from Hatebreed, and he says they, uh, that Jamie just calls out songs. They don't have a set list. That's that's super cool. That's wish, fucking A, dude. I, that's fucking killer. I, I would, we, but, we, we need structure, though, because yeah. the way that everything's paced, I mean, we do, and it's such high energy from the first thing. Totally. You know, and with punk rock, it's like, and we're doing 26 songs, right? And so to get those to flow good, and then when you, and even like subtracting or adding something, you got to like really think about it because, you know, sometimes the songs that we're adding might be, might be have a similar vibe as this. And then you find yourself with a set list with no, all mid tempo songs. And you're like, well, fuck, we need some fast shit or we need some of this shit or we don't have any ska songs. Fuck, yeah. Fuck, fuck, you know, <laughs> or whatever. So it's like, it, it's a constant, like, you know, it's like a Lego building, you know, you're just kind of trying to make it all work and yeah. flow. But most importantly, if you're, if you're not flowing up on stage, that's not going to translate. If you're kind of, you know, push pulling up there, that's going to translate to the crowd. And we're very authentic up there. So it's like, you know, and I think that's one of the things about Rancid and I'm, I'm talking about, you know, them in this, this case, but like we, we are, what happens up there is like so much different than what we are off of there. Right. So it's just another, but it's that, that's that much energy, even though we might be, you know, 25, 30 years older than we were when we first started doing this, right. it's still that same feeling. Like I'm still some songs, I don't know if this has happened to you, but like there'll be some songs that we play and I'll remember the smell of the room when we wrote the song or the smell of the thing or the memory or the feeling I had, you know, 25 years ago when these lyrics came out and where we were. And I, and I'm like in this whole other different thing, you know, being yeah. up there. Yeah. That, that is the gener generation kill, especially uh, I, cause I write all the lyrics. So everything has a point of reference from what, what was I thinking about? What was, where was my life and all that. And all that kind of plays part. And when I'm yeah. in it, I'm in it. Um, I've seen, uh, I saw, I've seen Rancid, you know, a bunch of times I was, you know, you know me, I was part of the TSOL, um, L7 deal in the early days of, uh, Warp Tour and, and Pennywise and all that. So I saw, I got to see you guys a bunch of times before I actually met you. Um, and I saw you with the Ramones at Lollapalooza in New York at uh, Randall's oh, Island. Shit. Oh, wow. I was there. I was there and I was, uh, I was newly sober. I was only like sober, like this is 1993 or four. Yeah. I'm gonna have to say been. right around there. And I, I got sober no, in 93. Would, no, it, no, it would have been that 95, been 96, bro. 96. So I had three years sober. So I, I, but I still remember, I remember it was one of the first, uh, um, shows I went to like by myself without like a good support group. And I remember, and I remember seeing people just getting fucked. But then when you guys came on and, and, uh, and Joey Markey came out, I, I remember, uh, can you talk about that? Cause from a fan's point of view, dude, for me, that was, it was fucking mind blown for, from, I can't imagine what it was for, like for you. Well, you know, it's funny because, you know, we had, we, we had formed a friendship with the Ramones and we had talked about doing, um, some touring with them and they were going to, the original plan was the Ramones were going to do their very last tour <clears throat> and Rancid was going to be support. We were going to do South America, <clears throat> excuse me, Europe and the States with them. And we were kind of at the end of our touring cycle cycle. And they were sort of kind of going to just do a farewell kind of thing. So we get, uh, we get this, the message from, you know, the management like hey Lollapalooza wants to do you know wants to have Rancid on and we're like well who else is on it and they said well funny enough the Ramones have been asked the Ramones said that the only way that they're going to do it is if Rancid does it and so I remember we were we were flying to um to Australia uh, the next day and it was around Christmas time so it would have been Christmas 95 and uh I remember I called johnny and i said johnny is this true and he said yeah we're only way we're going to do it is if you guys do it but if you guys do it we'll do it and i said okay well i'm going to tell our people that the only way we're going to do it is if you guys do it so 
that's how it happened. So they booked both of us and um, it was rad because number one, you're seeing the band that created this whole fucking genre of music, punk rock, as we know it. I mean, some people will say, well, it was this, it was Iggy Pop. It was, it was the Ramones. It was the Ramones. <laughs> and it was, and the punk rock was an American thing. It was like baseball, like punk rock got, fr- got taken from the Ramones, was, was, was transported by the Ramones to England. And then all of a sudden the Sex Pistols, the Clash, the Damned happened. Right. Well, yeah. I heard, I heard a story. I was with, um, me and John Joseph were hanging out one time and, uh, we went to the unveiling of the Joe Strummer uh, uh, mural at the bar in New York. And it was like, yeah. so we're standing there and we're just talking. And next thing you know, man, Mick Jones is standing next to us. And we had this, whoa, right? So then me and John uh, had this conversation. He goes, dude, when, when, the, when the Ramones went over to England the first time, the Clash were, were, were fighting to get through the back door because there was no way to get in the club and they were climbing through windows because they had to see this fucking band because they knew. And that's what started that whole, the whole English thing was watching the Ramones. That's, the first 100%, de- that's 100% yeah. true. Yeah. So, I mean, if you don't have the Ramones, you don't have modern day punk rock. If you don't have a mixture of the Ramones and Motorhead, you don't have hard music as we know it today. You don't totally. have thrash metal. You don't yeah. have the Metallicas. You don't have Slayers or Exodus or Rancid or GBH or Discharge. Yeah. You don't have any of these bands. Sorry, you can you can trace it all back to Motorhead and the Ramones, and that yes. those are the two bands that defined what rock and roll is and what it's become. So hard music, I should say, you know, rock and roll. But I mean, you know, being privy to watching them every night and seeing, you know, them so many times in a row and then not only that but you know being always lumped they always lumped us together it was we used to call it yeah uh, (laughs) we we would call it the punk rock uh because they would always put us in the ramones our dressing rooms would always be the furthest away from the stage but together right so and we would call it like what we call the punk rock ghetto (laughs) because we were far well metallica's helicoptering in every night even yeah. though newstead newstead was was on the bus and hanging out all day every day he was super rad and i love lars and i love kirk yeah. and i love james you know they're, they're, yeah. they're my homies whatever but they were doing that thing <clears throat> and but newstead would actually be traveling with us you know right out with us. so um it was really cool it was a really cool experience to to be with them and you know marky and and um you know just listening to the stories and just, you know, those guys were so funny together, you know, they had such a great rapport and, um, you know, obviously there was a lot of tension between Johnny and Joey, but yeah, Marky was always the glue there. And CJ, I think was riding his motorcycle. So he was, he was, he was, yeah, he was, yeah, yeah, he was not even really part. Yeah. 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 I met CJ at a sick of it all show a few years ago. Um, CJ's the best. He lives out here now in California. Does he? Yeah. I met him in the, it was in New York. And then, um, yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, it was, it was a cool experience, you know, because you're seeing your heroes and, you know, you're palling around with them. You're at catering with them. You know, you're doing jokes with them. You're, you're you know, you, 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 these are the guys that I saw on, on, you know, Gil Cable in 1979 <clears throat> doing rock and roll high school. I saw that movie 31 fucking times, right. you know, over the course of a month, me and my brother stayed up and went through the TV guide and highlighted every time it was on and watched it, no matter if it was 2 a.m. or 4 a.m. or 5 a.m. or whatever, you know. So, and you know, we didn't have a VCR, so we couldn't record it, but we watched it every fucking time, you know, it was on. And it was like a big part of my childhood, you know, that, that, that band. And, yeah. Uh, but I will say that, like, you know, uh, the bands that really sort of made a bigger impact on me. I mean, obviously the Ramones were the gateway drug, but bands like the bit of uh, the, most of the Oi stuff, like the business and blitz and upstarts and, and they were political. They were singing like political songs. They were doing more, whereas the Ramones were more like, kind of like, it was, it was very simple. Like lyrics, they weren't very deep to them. They were, but like for the most part, but like the clash and the business and all those, all those bands, though, they started going like hardcore anti-fascist political stuff well, in their lyrics. Yeah, 
Yeah, and but and I think that's probably what formed a lot of my views, not only my experience growing up, but you know, I think a lot of the music that I was listening to, you know, was was coming from a place of you know, even though they were in England and having this whole other experience, it still felt like they were having my experience. Yeah. And um, I, I, that's the only way I can really kind of, you know, put it into words. But uh, it, there, was a rela- there was a relatable quality to that music and to that message. And that's, for me, like mo- the most important thing about music in a lot of ways. <clears throat> it's like I can get into the Ramones and the Toy Dolls and that kind of morbidly joking kind of stuff. And, you know, I mean, but, the, you know, I, I, but I also love the upstarts and, you know, and I, and I love that political message, you know, I, it's, it's just something for me that makes me feel like um, invigorated in a lot of ways. I, I feel like I always wanted to, you know, I always stood for something, you know, and I always will stand for something whether or not I want to get mixed up in all the, the Bollywood and fucking drama of it. That's another thing. But, yeah. You know, my, my political beliefs and, you know, all you have to do is read an interview over the last 30 years I've done and you'll figure out that I'm a fucking, you know, fucking card carrying commie. Yeah. But, um, <laughs> so I, I purposely didn't because, uh, because I have a, because I, I have a friendship with you and we, we talk, you know, we talk occasionally well, and I'm, I, you know, I'm, I'm in, more, I'm more of a constitutionalist. You know, I, I feel like, you know, right. I'm not really, I don't really fall into the Democrats or to the Republicans or, no. or to any of that nonsense. You know, I'm, 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 they're I'm, both I'm equally kind of insane. Middle. They're both equally insane. I feel like, you know, the death penalty works in a fair and equal justice system, which we don't have, but, okay. but I also believe in the women's right to choose, you know? So yeah. I think that both of those things would be polar opposite sides of the, the aisle, you know? So yeah. it's like, you know, if you're going to rape a little kid, you should be fucking killed. I'm sorry. Done. No, Later. no recourse. There's no, and it's, and, it's and, not even, a, it's not even a fucking question. If you're caught red-handed raping a kid, priest, no priest, person, regular person, don't give a fuck. Done. It, it just take you out in the back and old yeller, old yeller style. It shouldn't be this long, drawn out, <laughs> conclusive. And then you know, yeah, let's, it's a let's fucking let's joke. It's yeah, a joke. It's all okay, so when when the explainer were singing, Maggie's a cunt. Right. I re- I didn't know who Maggie. I didn't realize what that was, but I knew Reagan was a cunt, and I could fucking I could get it. You know what I mean? I yeah. kind of, oh I know what they're talking about, man. They're just as angry as I am. So I kind of you know. Well, and, I just uh, I just I just kind of feel like with but with the justice system that we have in America, it's bullshit. It's all you know. I mean, if you look at at, at the the statistics, it's mostly it's people money. of color. It's money, dude. You know, it's, money. It's poor people, people of color, and people that don't have any representation. I mean, I mean. It's 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 ridiculous. It's all about money. You're right. Money it boils all, every all the world's problems. I feel like come down to finance. Why are the two richest guys on the planet trying to fucking build a spaceship to get the fuck out of here? No. My new album. My new album's called MK Ultra because oh, I fucking know about that shit and all the not all the lyrics. A lot of the lyrics are about it because I I, don't, I read shit. And I, you know, we, you know, life won't wait was a very, you know, that record for us was a very uh, heavy undertaking because we were kind of coming into this place of finding out about like the truth, the real truth, you know, uh-huh. and because you always were sort of suspect about what was going on, what the real agenda is. And that, you know, people call it conspiracy theories and things like that. And it's just like they're doing it out in the fucking open now, people. Like, you know, yeah. it's, 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 it's right in front of us. It's like when I'm at an opened A's baseball game yeah, and they're telling me that I get two free hot dogs with my first shot of vaccination that they're giving to at the ballpark. I'm thinking to myself, what in the handmaid's tale is going on around here? And if you don't know what the handmaid's tale is, go watch that show and then see where we're at in society <laughs> and tell me if there's any similarities. But my point is, it's like, you know, dystopia is here. Like, 1984, you know, dude. It's 19. right here. It's right now. You know yeah. what I mean? It's like you're you're trying to force people. Like now we have, now we have a situation where if you want to gather public here publicly in San Francisco, you have to have a booster. Like, really? when is it going to end? Like, you're calling something a vaccination that is not even a vaccination. I th- I thought that vaccine. You know what? Let's do this right now. 
Look, look, look on the internet right now and tell me what vaccination means. What is the word? What does Webster's Dictionary say what oh. vaccination means? Let me look. I just want to, let me read this. It says, just wait until conspiracy theorists discover they're part of a conspiracy to use conspiracy <laughs> theorists to spread different information, different disinformation via conspiracy theories. Yeah. <laughs> Fucking. <laughs> the term conspiracy theory was invented by the CIA right after uh, JFK. To debunk, to, yeah, yeah. To, debunk, to debunk, you know, people who were telling the truth. So, I mean, that that in itself is like, you know, I'm, and I don't want to get lost in it, but uh, you know, my 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 point is, it's like I thought vaccination meant that you can't get something. So I can't if I type in vaccination, I can't get the. Uh, the, Just the vaccination word word meaning what right it's, all it does it's all COVID 19 and stuff so i can't even get like you don't have I, a dictionary no I'm, I'm doing it right now i'm doing it right now i'm doing right. so vaccination definition here we go yeah all here right. we go treatment with a vaccine to produce immunity against a disease inoculation right so inoculation means you can't get it right immunity means that you can't get it so eventually but that's never the way it is. The, the flu has been going on every year, right? Well, let me ask a question. So if you're vaccinating me, why not call it a flu shot? Because that's basically what it is, right? Basically. It's not a vaccination, right? Or is it technically? I'm not too sure. But I thought it's like when you get vaccinated for something like venereal warts, you can't get it, right? Or if you get vaccinated for the mumps or polio or these things, does that mean that you can't get it? I thought that's what it meant. I so, thought that you carry the antibodies for it, but if you were to, so here, I think this is how the mumps work because it happens a lot in hockey, right? <clears throat> I have a vaccination for the mumps, right? Right. But I lick a doorknob that had the mumps on it. Right. Right. And then I make out with some girl. She's right. got the mumps if she's not vaccinated for it. Got it. Okay. So you can still carry it. Yeah, that's kind of the okay. same thing here. But you're not going to get sick from it. So I can't go see my dad because my dad had a lung transplant a year ago. Right, right, right. I can't go see my dad because I just had COVID for the second time. I've had it twice. And the second time was, wasn't was as bad as the first, but I've had it. But basically what it is, and I'm not going to sit here and go, oh, it's just a flu. It's not just a flu. No, it's not. It's not. There's, there, there, I think it's kind of like, you know what I, re I related to? I related to, to alcoholism in the sense that I have friends that can drink compulsively and drink heavily right. and are not fucking alcoholics. They just, they just turn it off. But for right. me, I take one drink, dude, I'm in New York on a Friday. I wake up, I'm in Ohio on Monday at a Judas Priest concert. <laughs> Don't know how I got there. And everyone's like, you drove, dude. It was your fucking idea. <laughs> oh yeah. That's, yeah, my, my, that's yeah, my, my point. My point is, is though, how, how are we putting this information out to the world? So if you're calling something, something that it's actually not, maybe it's a vaccination to these strains or whatever. Let's be specific. It's not an overall inoculation. Yes. Right? So how many shots is it going to really fucking take? Mm -hmm. I'm going to say 93. We're going to have to get 93 fucking injections. And the last one's going to be in the head of your dick with a 22 right. gauge needle. It's like, I'm, fucking, I'm, I'm into it. I, I want to jump to 93 right now. So that's, that's, that's giving me a boner. But what's your favorite tattoo you got? Your favorite tattoo that you got. And you're covered, dude. Are you got a full body suit yet? No, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm splotchy. Do you find um, you get older, the harder to get because of the pain? Oh, dude. It's <laughs> fucking dude, pain. I'm like, I'm like 40 hours away from being fucking fully body suit. And I, I just I, want to finish this thought. Oh, okay. okay, go ahead. Because I, you know, so I'm not saying that this is a conspiracy. I'm just saying that the way that things are being presented to us is off. It feels it's like off. a conspiracy. Well, no, I'm not saying it's a conspiracy. I'm just saying it feels, it's just not, it's not, it's off. It's off. Well, well look, man, the U.S. government at one point was going into mental institutions and prisons and they were dosing people with high levels of LSD right. and filming them to figure out what would happen because they wanted to create a soldier that right. could go into a situation and kill somebody and then not have to remember to do it, right? <laughs> they wanted to create that. So right. why wouldn't they 
fuck us at every turn since. Like they said, this stopped and this went on from 1948 to 1974 before they got caught. And then they said, oh, we stopped doing it. But like when you watch the Bourne movies, man, like that shit's that's real. Like <laughs> they fucking all they did was go, okay, we closed that program. We're going to start another one now. Right. You know what I mean? So no, like I, that's I, real. Yeah, I I agree with that, and that's why I say to myself, it's like how could I be listening to this music for the last 40 years and not think something is suspicious? Fucking okay, A, man. Because you, are your lyrics important to you? Yeah, for sure. Absolutely. For sure. I mean, to me, that's part of the reason I think I've educated myself. And then like, because I'll, maybe I've heard something out of Jello Biafra's mouth or whomever it is. Yeah. And I go and I look at it. Yeah. I go and study it. And I go, well, what the fuck was up with Vietnam? Why is he saying holiday in Cambodia? You know, Dude. Why, why is he kinky sex? Him? Kinky sex makes the world go round. Are you fucking kidding me, dude? I, that was the opener for Generation Kill for like a year. I'd play that song really. I shut the lights off and play that. And people like, "What fucking song is this?" And I'm like, "Dude, this is one of the greatest songs ever written for the but, second best punk band in, in America." But but you know what I'm saying? So it's like the, those are the things that like I I I'm not talking like you know I'm some French aristocratic fucking college professor. I'm just saying uh, like. I, I just, I question things and I, mm -hmm. I, I, that's just my nature, what way I'm built. I just, I can't just fall in line. I'm just not that way. Now people might be that way and that's totally fine. But lyrics to me are very important because I believe that's really what makes you think, you know yeah. what I mean? And it's like, I don't know all the answers. Just like, I don't know. I didn't really know what vaccinated me meant. Right. It's just like, I want to know though. Right. Yeah. And I want to find it out and I want to educate myself. So what does it fucking mean? That's kind of what, what has been my journey in a lot of ways. And I, but I feel like being part of the problem or being part of, you know, is, is not really the solution for it all. Like, it's like, for me, resisting, you know, on certain things just not, doesn't serve me anymore. Right. So it's like, you know, I, it's like, it's like when you have kids, it's like, I can tell my kid a hundred times to clean his room and, and I'm only going to feel satisfaction when that room is clean, right? So why would I upset myself enough whether his fucking room is clean or not? You know what I mean? Does that make sense? Did I just Yeah. Yeah, so you're turning into your you're turning into uh, an old version of yourself. You're forgetting what it's like to be 12 and not give a fuck if your room is clean or not. But that's the thing. It's like, <laughs> my, you know, exactly. Like I go up into my 14-year-old's area and it's like fucking cliff bar wrappers and fucking chocolate all over the bed. It smells like soda feet. Ugh. Ugh, soda cans and just shit. And I'm just like, how do you survive? And it's like, <laughs> little did I, I was doing the same shit when I was his age, you know? Yeah. I, I don't have any kids, so I don't know what that's like. Um, well, so I, I uh, you know, it definitely humbles you and it puts things into perspective. I, I will say that was my experience. I'm glad that I was, you know, blessed with that because it really kind of changed my mind in a lot of things. I, I really kind of took myself a lot out of a lot of equations that I thought that I belonged in. And I thought that I was the most important in. You yeah. Know? Now you're not. Yeah. Now no. you're not the most important person in the world. Yeah. No. Yeah. They are. So, yeah. But I have, I like to have fun and I like to, to riff and I like to explore and, you know, talk with people and get people's ideas and opinions, even if they're polar opposite than mine, there's yeah. still a place for, in the, in my world for conflicting arguments and cl conflicting opinions, you know? Yeah. And, and I, I feel like that's really the human experience because like my girlfriend, who's going to, you know, uh, mother more of my children sooner, probably rather than later is 10 years younger than me and has a totally different life experience. And I tell you what, you know, I don't, I, my, perspective on her generation has completely changed because now I live with it. Right. Right. It took that, it took that experience. It took that, uh, you know, that, that, um, you know, it took, it, it, it took me to learn about her experience to understand where she's coming from. And I gotta be honest, some of the ideas are a lot better than mine, but then there's huh. some ideas that are just so fucking stupid that I'm just like, how the fuck can you even think like that? But I'm sure that that's what she's having with me, too, because I'm yeah. 50, she's 40. And I'm sure that's why our parents were like, what the fuck is wrong with you? You're a waste yeah. of talent or a waste of, you know, you have so much potential. Remember that one? Yeah. So it's like, 
they see things that we can't. And sometimes the younger generations see things that we can't as older. And that's why I always try to keep my foot in with new music, new bands, new things, new ideas. You know what I mean? Because that's the way you, you know, I feel like you stay young in this shit. You know what I mean? I have, um, so before I'm going to go back to the tattoo thing, but before we go, I have, I have a thought. Um, I know that when, uh, when I going back, it's, it was a conflicting thing with me, Mm -hmm. um, getting sober in the beginning. Um, I was, uh, I was 25. Um, there was nobody my age around that time doing what I was doing was very rare. Most people were older and I was inducted in New York in a, in a group of older guys who, um, kind of took me under their wing and it was always about helping others. That was, that was the key to getting out of yourself and out of, and it, so, uh, I remember, um, this guy said to me, there's no room for, for racism here. There's no room for homophobia. There's no room for judging someone from where they come because here you are and you're at the same table right now, right here, right now. And you are, that's the bond that you're going to have. And that person could uh, turn around and help you one day. And I remember, I was having trouble. I was in LA. I was living in LA in the early 2000s. And um, uh, Precious from uh, Jen from uh, L7 uh, hit you up and asked you because I was going to San Francisco to rehearse and I didn't know anybody except the band and they were all insane. So, um, and um, I'm going to call it the bus stop, right? So you told me, hey, I'm going to be at this bus stop, meet me here. And uh, you didn't show. But then I realized, and then when I called, I was like, oh, yeah, he didn't, he didn't show up. And uh, he, he missed the bus. And, and, uh, and Chen goes, yeah, but you didn't. And I was like, uh, and I would never forget you for that. I, I actually, it wasn't, I didn't, I felt like a, like a, like a, like a, just a snarl for it. I was like, oh, that, all right, cool. Well, now he did his, that's what, and I remember you for that. And I remember years later when we actually finally met and, and started talking and became friends, um, that uh i don't think i ever told you that story but that 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 happened and uh i wanted to thank you for that because that was one of those things that we always try to just be better people right yeah but there was a time when i when i wasn't there was a time when i struggled with it when i was selfish and i was and all those darker things were were ruling and and i remember being on the road in europe and i went to uh one of the bus stops in 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 holland and nobody spoke English, but I felt okay. You know, everybody was at the bus stop was hanging, hanging out and, and, and it just, okay. Maybe one guy had a little broken, but it was, it was, it was, uh, well, I, I think, you know, the, the whole idea of service is, is, you know, it's something that, that, um, I learned at, at a very early age, you know, with my mom and stuff, because she was always about that you know, and she'd always say that, you know, that's how people survive. Right. And she was right. And I remember social distortion, you know, coming over and my, and even though my mom hated the fact that me and my brother were punk, she treated like them, them, like her, you know, own children fed them frozen hamburgers and gave them a place to rest their head. And, you know, you know, and she was always, you know, that was the way that our household was, was very open and inviting. And, I didn't know too much about the differences in a lot of ways, maybe because I didn't really see them. I wasn't really sort of exposed to that whole idea of, of judgment, you know, so right. young. I, I, the only people that I think I kind of hated were like presidents and rich people. So yeah. that was to the extent of my hatred. Um, and I feel like the, the whole idea of service is for me is, you know, it's not about sacrifice. You know, it's about freely giving to you what it was so freely given. Yes. You know, freely giving back so freely what was given to you. To begin and with. and, you, and you, you did that for me. And I wanted I'm to thank you for that. You know, well, I mean, and, but that's that's a classic move I do, though. It's right. Like, you know, it's like, <laughs> I'm going to get you there. Right. And it doesn't matter if I'm there or not. And hopefully you'll see that, you know. Yeah. So, um, this, I, you know, that's one of the things like that I've been trying to teach my kids. It's, it's, and it's one of the, one of the, the, you know, the song God, gods and guns. It's like kind of sums it up for me. It's like, 
I feel like, you know, society, we're always kind of looking out into the world to fix, to find security, to find love, to find validation. And I did that for years. And I did that through drinking and using women, um, whatever it was, you know, collecting, whatever it may have been. It was always, I was trying to build a safer environment for myself. And meanwhile, what I was doing was isolating. I wasn't really seeing that. And I think that because I was looking so much outward, you know, a lot of what was in here was lying dormant and I didn't know how to access, um, access the, the things that were going to make me feel secure, validated and loved here. And I would always wonder why, why don't these relationships work out for me? Or why don't these friendships work out for me or, or whatever it was. And it was realized because I couldn't transmit something I didn't have. Right. So like, you know, now I'm in this relationship with this woman where I'm finally experiencing like this real true intimacy with another human being. And I don't mean just fucking or right. whatever. I mean, real actual intimacy, like emotional, mental, mental, physical, spiritual. And like actually being okay with being 100% myself. There's no hidden agenda. There's yeah. no me stuffing something down and just accepting it. There's none of that stuff. Like if there's something wrong, it gets discussed. It comes out in the open and we move on and we hopefully find a solution. I've never really had a relationship with people like that before. And now it's translating into my experience with my kids. And that song, Gods and Guns, is about like that looking out to fix me. Like, it's not about that because everything you need, like the 50 year old Lars can calm down the five year old little guy that still thinks he needs to survive. Right. He tries to run the show a lot of the times. Now, the 25 year old Lars wants to punch the 50 year old Lars for <laughs> saying that, what he just said right there. But totally. <laughs> that's the growth. <laughs> that is what it is. Yeah. I invite, invite Gods and Guns is one of my favorites on the record. And I, I was going to ask you, when did you record that? Did you, did you record that before you met her or, or, or after? Well, Gods and Guns, I recorded with the old firm casuals back. That was the first time it made an appearance off the Butcher's Banquet EP. Right. But I, yeah. But I, I wrote that song actually for my kids when I was in England. And I don't know what I would do. I was there doing a tattoo thing with my buddy, Nick, and I was at his house. And I just kind of picked up the guitar and it just kind of came out of me. I was thinking about him. I was meditating. Because it's haunting. The The whole record is is haunting, dude. The, it's just, I, I know, you know, I'm, you know, I'm not, I'm afraid to admit that I'm, I'm a huge fan of you and, and all your work. Same back. Um, all, you know, old firm casuals is, uh, is fucking killer. And, you know, so this record was when I first put it on, I was like, Oh, it's Lars with a fucking acoustic. Awesome. And it was, well, you know, it was, it was haunting and cool. You know what I mean? Well, so I, I did this show, you know what I mean? And then I, I, so I, you know, the last couple of years, the divorce, my mom's passing all this stuff, you know, Pain is that touchstone to growth, right? And it also sparks a lot of creativity. And also like coming back to my roots of who I am right now, you know, I'm really kind of accepting that spiritual part of me and really accepting that kind of soft, softer side to say, you know, I don't know for a lack of a better term. And uh, accessing that, you know, and finding that. And like I said, the validation, and I don't look for that anymore. I don't care about that. I don't look for the security out there anymore. I don't look for it in money. I don't look for any of that stuff. You know, I've always been taken care of. I've always been taken care of. Even when I didn't have anything to sh a pot to piss in, I was always taken care of, you know, and you know, if life was fair, I'd be dead. Honestly. That's so, true. And I would be too, you know, and we have that bond. That's what I think that's what bonded us when we first met, when we first started sure. talking. You know, sure. um, that sure. I deserve worse than I have. No, totally. So I think, you know, that whole idea of like, you know, finding that security and that strength and whatever it is in here and being able to co-create with the fucking universe, however that what it is. I mean, we're all manifest. I think, you know, people who struggle with addiction, struggle with these types of things are very creative people, you know, and I think that a lot of us just don't know how to channel that energy. So for me, the solution was drinking and using forever. Right. Yeah. So, and when that stopped working, I had to find something else and I had to fill, you know, but my point is, is that like, you know, I went into that recording session with, with new songs, 
you know, I went there with all these songs I'd written. I'd written like 30 some odd songs through all of my, you know, just about this kind of where I was going, you know. And I wrote these really great songs and I went and I had the ideas and a lot of them were pretty well sort of um, refined. And, and, you know, I had them close to finished or, you know, 5% you no know, more or whatever. And then I just had that idea. I was like, why don't I just fucking re-record some of these songs and see where I'm at with them now? You know, right. I mean, like Skunks, you know, I recorded back in 2001 when I was 20 some odd years old. Really? You know, or, yeah. Huh. So, you know, I mean, it's like some of these songs, you know, I had done years ago and I just wanted to see if they still had the same feeling, which they did. So the four, the six songs that you see, which is a Kiss cover, you know, UK yeah. subs cover, and then four songs I've done with other bands, they were kind of either a written like they were, you know, at that time, just being in a, in a, in a guitar. And I just wanted to see if they translated and I feel like they kind of did. And, you know, put yeah. little sprinkles of the Hammond and the piano a no. few percussion things here and there. I don't know. I just had fun. I really liked it, dude. I, I really liked that. I listened to it when I, when it, the night it came out, I listened to it twice in a row and I found it uh, just a little haunting and different and cool. I mean, you know, I'm a, you know, I'm a, I'm a fan of you across the board. I, I think uh, somebody asked me recently, what was the, you know, the kind of that's, what was one of your best gigs? And I go, best gig when fucking Lars let me come up and sing with fucking Old Firm Casuals in Arizona. And we turned a, one, a Old Firm Casuals song into a fucking Slayer song. It was That's fucking right. <laughs> highlights of my life dude i can't deny that it really was it was uh it was really fun and then we yeah. really did the, the sabbath shit too yeah we did a little bit of i think it was either paranoid or war pigs paranoid or whatever or yeah <laughs> I mean, but that's yeah. what it's all about, you know, it's about yeah. all about having fun, you know, and I think at the end of the day, it's just being with like-minded people. And you know, as well as I do, do that, like these scenes have been so similar for so long and, you know, we're coming together, you know, cause I think we're all older and wiser and you can, and you can see bands like, you know, all getting together on one show and doing this. It's all hard music at the end of the day. And we all yeah. have the same idea. We all come yeah. from that same place. You know what I mean? We just might look a little different, you know. That's, yeah. that's really what it boils down to. So, you are you a dog or a cat guy? I'm a cat guy. Me too. I got two of them little fuckers. Yeah. Yeah, I love dogs. I mean, I really do, but they stink and they're messy. And I'm a Virgo, and so I'm hypersensitive about my cleanliness. Oh, you know? I don't have that problem, but I do. The dogs are just uh, they're like kids, dude. They're so much fucking work. Where a oh. cat, a cat, you just give them a little water and food, and they're good. And they don't dude, even give, give them a place to shit, <laughs> eat, and sleep. That's, That's all it. you gotta do. You don't gotta walk them. Yeah. You, you don't wanna clean up after them. They're pretty cats are very clean animals. I mean, they're pretty, I think yeah. some, some dogs are too. Oh, yeah. I got Persians, so they fucking have hairballs because they're long haired. So they yeah, yeah. they puke every uh, hairballs every now and again. When you find one on the that's bed, is like that's a that's a morning ruiner. Yeah, you know? but you know you can wash the sheets. It's true. So, All right. Well, Lars, man, this has been a, a great interview, and we're gonna. Oh, oh, before we go, what's your favorite tattoo you got? What was the what, oh. what was the one that means you the most? Was it skunks on your forehead? No, it's probably my kids' names. No shit. All right. Yeah. Because, right. I mean, it's on my fretting hand, so I look at them, you know? Yeah, all right. And I and I did them myself, you know, in Japan. So huh. I like those a lot. Um, I mean, every tattoo kind of tells a story in some sense. Exactly. But a lot of the guys that tattooed me are no longer with us, you know? So it's kind of weird that you're carrying around a piece of them in a weird way, you know? Ooh, that's a, that's a yeah, that's, that's huh, yeah. 
That's so deep. I've got a few. I got a few tattoos from people who passed. You know, hmm. so and they were my good friends too. And so I mean, it's that that that's the kind of stuff that really means the most to me. I mean, at this point, I I just get stupid little ones. You know. Yeah. Are you coming here in February? You coming to Arizona? February, yeah. yeah. No, I'm no, gonna... uh, no, no. I'm not going to be there till. I'm going to be there at the end of March with my solo thing. All right. Well, you know, I'll be there. Yeah, I'll yeah. take, you know what, dude, man? I'll take you to a tattoo shop. You, I'll tattoo you and you can tattoo me. And we'll, well fucking... I'll tell you what. Th- I will play that by ear because the number <laughs> one tattoos fucking hurt and then trying to heal a tattoo on the road. And no, we're going to do little ones. We're going to do little baby ones. It doesn't give a fuck. It'll turn into oh. a fucking weird abscess and I'll look like a dick. <laughs> <laughs> So let me ask you a few, uh, your favorite songs, like what songs that changed your life? That's where we're at now in this, in this uh, okay. thing. So they don't have to go in any chronological order, but um, I know I have a list of songs in it that changed the way I think and the well, way how I... How many? How many? You gotta get let's, say, many? let's say 10, and then what I'm going to do is I'm going to take those 10, I'm going to make a Spotify list, but I'm going to add my favorite songs of yours to that Spotify. Oh. But it'll be a cool playlist, but they're going to be your songs, and then it's going to be my favorite songs of yours okay um one definitely is i'll be your sister by motorhead i'll be your sister by motorhead all right that's like that 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 just gets me fired up i just want to just like you know i've turned that song on and unleash the beast you know eat eat the rich makes you want to punch somebody in the face that's that's a great that's another great track i mean i mean is there a bad (laughs) so all right let's see here uh Fight the Power, Public Enemy. Okay. That's a good um, one. Let's see here. Oh, fuck. Uh, um, Give Me Fire by GBH. Okay. Uh, Smash the Discos by The Business. Ooh, all right. Uh... Oh, fucking Seasons by fucking Slayer. Ooh, all right. Yeah. Um, fuck, man. Uh, King of the Jungle by Last Resort. Well, you're surprising me. I thought you were going to say, ah, the fucking Ramones, the Clash, no, Sex Pistols. I mean, I, but I know that was all... Know. I, there's, I mean, uh, you know, it's stuff that I'm thinking about. Like I recent, like I, I this will always change, you know. Right. I'm Kiss. just gonna ask him. Yeah. Kiss. Oh, um, well, Kiss was that was your first band, so yeah, that that have to be on the list. Love her all I can. Love her all I can. Mm. All right. Um, or getaway, one or the other. Okay. Um, I love that record. I love Dress to Kill. Um, but Love Her All I Can is just like my jam, dude. Um. I would say Slade, uh, Goodbye to Jane. Um, fuck, what else we got here? I'm trying to think. Like, what, have, what did I just... Oh, fuck, I got to throw some Run DMC in there. Let's put in uh, Rockbox. There you go. Love that track. Yeah. It's like a band playing, you know? Yeah. Did you hear his uh, new shit? He's got a new band. DMC. It's called DMC and the Hellraisers, yeah, and they're yeah. they're good, man. He did uh, he did a couple of songs. I, I I talked to him about two weeks ago, oh, and so. uh, yeah, we were talking about doing a show together with his new rock band. Oh fuck uh, yeah! But uh, I want to say, you know what? The new Body Count. I've been fucking listening to ooh. that. Uh, I think the first track is called Carnivore. I love that mm-hmm. track. Huh. All right. Um, I always loved. I, I like that shit. You know, anything that's hard. Um. Let's see. I would probably go with. Um, um, There's no Primus on your list. Hell's no. <laughs> nice guys. You, I, you know what? I'm sorry. I, I, you know I, what? Okay, so I'm going to tell you a true story. Okay? And this is nothing. I, they're, they're very nice people. Okay. But my, uh, I went to go see Slayer and I took both my boys. And my oldest at the time said, hey, dad, while Primus was playing. I said, yeah. He says, it sounds like there's 16 different bands playing different songs (laughs) right now. (laughs) That's all I got to say. Yeah. 
me and you had a good laugh about that because I love Primus and we were in the back of the car driving and we were arguing back and forth. That's why I said it. <sighs> yeah. No, but uh, but uh, much due respect to them. I mean, they're you know, I think and I, I find a reason. The reason that I like them so much is because I was doing a ton of psychedelics when I first found them. So you know, yeah. Uh, I would say Dead Kennedys Kill the Poor. Oh well, yeah. All right. And uh, and I, that's probably about nine, right? I'm going to throw a curveball here. I'm going to throw a curveball. Nancy Sinatra. No. Um, it's it's uh, Music Box Dancer. Music Box Dancer. Yeah. Okay. And it's an instrumental. And I'm going to throw it in there because I love this song and I've loved it since I was four years old. And Music I've Box never- Dancer. Yeah, and I've never, ever, ever admitted it in my entire life, but I'm going to do it now. Oh, all right. I and was it's by, I, it's by, um, hang on a second, let me tell you. Music Box Dancer. My first song as a kid was uh, Jeremiah Was a Bullfrog. Oh, I love that song. Yeah. It was a good friend of mine. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I can't get into my iTunes for some reason. Music box dancer. Um, well, I'm gonna, I, I got them written. All, I'm going to write them all down. And I'm going to make a playlist. I will find it. Yeah. Hold, hold on. I'm going to find it right now. Oh, it's by. Oh, it was just there. Um, hang on. It's by Frank Mills. Frank Mills. Huh. What, what year was it from? Was it like a uh, I 60s song? Be, it could be 60s, early 70s. Wow. But my mom used to drive me to Cinnamon Preschool when she first got a job at Hewlett Packard and it would be like 5 a.m. And uh, it, uh, leaving on a jet plane would come on. Uh, Cecilia, You're Breaking My Heart, that song would come on. And then Music Box Dancer. And it would it'd be those three songs in a row every fucking morning. And for whatever reason, Music Box Dancer would be just about ending while I was getting out of the car to go into Cinnamon Preschool. Huh. And it always stuck with me. And I, I don't know why I still love this song, but I actually sometimes before shows will go into my bunk. No shit. And, I, and I'll play this song. Ooh, this is a large Francisco exclusive. Yeah. So, so, Dude. So, and I've never actually seen anybody before in my life about it, but fuck it. Who cares? <laughs> yeah. Well, okay. What's the hardest song you have to play live that you got to pull off? What's the hardest song? That, one of those songs that go, I really need to practice this because I'm going to, you don't have any? No. Really? No. Every no. every musician I've talked to so far goes, oh, yeah, I got a couple that just, like, if I don't sit down and practice for a couple hours or at least, or yeah, play those, it. Those are probably metal dudes, though. That's oh, yeah, they're all shredders. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, mean, I mean, that's to be expected. Okay. All right. I'm, like, okay. I'm like Malcolm Young, and, and, I'm, and I'm saying that just because. No, you are. You're the, yeah. Rhythm playing is your, your stellar. That's that's where I feel like I shine the best, and yeah. my pinnacle of a of a rhythm guitar player is Malcolm Young, and that's what I strive to be every yeah. time I set up. So to me, it's like you know I want to be as solid as I possibly can, and I mean there are songs that you know I I, I don't know I just feel like I feel like I'm very confident in what I do, and yeah. I don't I'm not saying that in an egotistical way. I'm just saying. I'm not going to go up there and not know it. Like if I don't know it. Oh I'm, yeah. 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 I know that about you. Yeah. Sometimes, sometimes bands have asked me, Hey, can you come and jam this song with me? I'm like, well, we're going to have to do a rehearsal like death angel. When they, when my the old firm did some shows with them, um, they said, well, we want to do two songs with you. And I was like, well, which songs? Well, we want to do ACDC dog eat dog. And we want to do GBH diplomatic community. And I said, well, I'm not jumping up there with you guys. We're going to do rehearsals. Yeah, I'm like really? I'm like, yeah. I gotta play. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna show up, and like, I don't play those songs on the regular. I've never played with your band before. Yeah, I want to. I want to rehearse. Oh, I'm rehearsing. That's why I came to your show, and I'm like, I, I, let me run through it once during sound check. And you're like, oh, you got a cheat sheet. And I'm like, yeah, man, I have to because I don't have the ability to keep. Either it's that's, the it was the weed or whatever I did. I burnt something out that. Yeah, but that's the thing. It's like, and and then it's funny because Rob actually fucked up the solo. <laughs> doggy or not was it doggy dog yeah it was doggy dog and uh i stopped him and because he was a little you know he was having some fun that night and i go uh uh-uh, uh uh-uh, because everybody kind of fell off he kept playing the solo after we were supposed to stop and i was like no 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 i go, we're gonna start it from the soul and this is during the show 
We're going to start it from the solo, and then we're going to finish the song. One, two, three, four. <laughs> and, 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 and everybody was having a good time. And even good, man. Was, he was laughing his ass off. And Ted. All those guys are so good. That's one of my all-time favorite bands, though, was Death Angel. Oh, so, man, I love them, man. man I fucking Act probably, 3. Yeah, dude, oh, I, everything that they've done, a lot of their newer stuff is even creative. It's a lot so, of their newer stuff. Fuck, yeah, it's so heavy. I, I can't thank on, you enough, man. I'm always here for you, Dukes, bro. Anytime. Yeah. I love chatting. This was really super fun for me, too. So Yeah. Hey, my new album's done. I, I'm going to I'm gonna put up, uh, I'm going to put your album out, too, on the, on the list for people to go... Uh, Check it out, uh, the Victory cool. album. Uh, also, cool. um, you know, I'm, I'm, uh, check I'll out put, the new put, last. Check out the new Last Resort record. I think you'll like it. Okay. It's and Skin uh, and Anthems, Skin and Anthems, Volume Four. Okay, I will put a link to that also, and cool. uh, and uh, I will also. Uh, I'm, I'm mastering the the new Generation Kill album, so I'll I send it to you. It. I'll send it to you its entirety. Yeah. Are you uh, going to put out a cassette version of it? I hope. No, uh, I know we're doing vinyl, but it's like two months out. So the album comes out January 24th, and the vinyl's not going to be out until March. Well, cassettes uh, are super cheap to put out, and you can put yeah. out as many or as little as you can. And I tell you what, I've been listening to nothing but cassettes these days, and it's no shit. my favorite format. Yeah. No shit. It's just fun, you know? Where do, where do you even fucking get a cassette player? Uh, fucking, you can get them. You can get them anywhere. I mean, wow. dude, ret ret are they making new ones? Are they retro, or are they making new ones? Well, they are making these new ones, but they're kind of dog shit. You kind of got to find a, go a good old working one. I mean, okay. But, but I mean, people will just collect them just to have it, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And you can, you, you know, they're, they're check out this place called uh, Tapehead City on Instagram. Okay. They, they put, they're putting out all that shit on cassette. All the Venom huh. stuff's now on cassette, Creator, everybody. Everybody's doing it. Wow. Okay. I'll look yeah. into that. Yeah. Do your thing, bud. Thank I you for this, man, so much. <laughs>